In this I hope not too long video, which has been sponsored by Audible but more of that later, I shall be talking about a late World War II German tank destroyer called the Hetzer. And straight away, even now, I know that there are people watching who will be thinking to themselves, oh dear, oh dear, he's called the Hetzer. Flaunting his ignorance there, that's not its official title, you know. Well, yes, I am going to be calling it a Hetzer because it's a good name. It's a good name, Hetzer. It's short, it's, it's, it's familiar, it's characterful. Uh, I know it works because people who know about uh, World War II vehicles all know what is meant when Hetzer, that word, is, is said. Um, and it's the, 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 the name that I was first introduced to this vehicle uh, with. And um, it also, it, it's quite characterful in, in its meaning. Uh, I've heard it translated loads of ways though. Uh, malicious agitator, chaser, beta, um, hassler, harrier. Um, rabble rouser and so forth. Um, so it's um, so some sort of there's no exact it, se it seems uh, English equivalent. Although the Hetzer and Hassler, I suppose, are reasonably similar in sound. Anyway, uh, it's a good name, and I also know that it's an authentic name in that there were people in World War II, including those in the German army, calling it the Hetzer at the time. So that's all right then. But yes, okay, officially, it was the Jagd Panzer 38. Or, to be a little bit more German about it, the Jagdpanzer uh, 38. Um, uh, or, to be even more pedantic, it was the Jagdpanzer 38T. Uh, the T uh, being for, uh, standing for the German word for Czechoslovakian. Uh, because this was based on an earlier Czech tank uh, called the Type 38. The, the, the light tank, or LT-38. Whew! Anyway, let's get into Bovington Tank Museum. It's a German tank destroyer that came out late in the war and it was issued to infantry divisions. Guderian asked for something like this. He wanted his men to have something with a bit of punch uh, to take on the enemy. And this was a tough nut to crack. From the front, it's got 60 uh, millimeter armor, which as you can see is very well sloped. So from the front, this has really good armor. From the sides and rear, not anything like so good. It's got a 75mm gun, which was uh, not devastating, but decent. It, would, it could do the job. And it was much more powerful than the gun that was on the 38T, which was the Czechoslovakian tank that this is based on. If you look at the wheels down the side, uh, then if you know what a 38T looks like, you'll recognize, oh, that's, that's the running gear of a 38T. Uh, but there was a little bit more work they had to do to convert, because they had to make the entire thing a little bit wider, and even so, can you see with these sloping sides and uh, lack of hatches or periscopes and so forth, there's very little room or visibility in this. How can you see what you're doing? Um, the driver and the gunner and the loader all had to fit into the same bit of space at the front of the vehicle, so there really wasn't very much for them. And the gunner and the loader ended up on the same side of the, as the, of the gun, which is not very convenient. Ergonomically, this was a nightmare. Um, it uh, steered like a cow, and although they were quite reliable because they were based on the, the 38T uh, running gear, so it had at least that going for it, but it really was... Um, uh, you, you were blind in this thing. You see there are no vision ports or anything along the side. There's only that tiny thing at the front. And this machine gun here, which is the heavy-barreled version of the MG34, designed specifically for tank use, um, it was a bit heavy for an infantryman to carry, but having a heavy barrel was good because it, it could absorb more heat. Um, that's actually quite unusual in that it's remote control. That can be fired from the inside of the, of the vehicle for self-defense. And that's all it had though. You see there's no bow machine gun, no coaxial machine gun. So if an enemy got here, that you've, you've got nothing. You, you can't see him, you can't depress that gun to shoot him, you've got no pistol ports, no way of seeing him, you're pretty doomed. Uh, so this was a bit of a mobile coffin, but it was reliable and it did do the job. It had a, a fairly decent gun. Um, so it was a, it's an example of many, many tanks like this. They're, they cobbled together them during the war, making the best of, of, of bad situations. So this is a, a recycled Czechoslovakian tank into a very small and cramped uh, tank destroyer. One snag with that rooftop machine gun uh, was that it couldn't be reloaded from inside the vehicle. So uh, once you fired blindly off your 50 or 75 rounds in the drum magazines, 
then what are you going to do? You're going to have to get out onto the top and, and reload it in an exposed position. And uh, whilst you're firing blindly, of course, you're very unlikely to hit anything. Now, I've read uh, that this rooftop machine gun was popular with the troops, which I can believe. I can imagine, for instance, if you've been recru recruited quite late in the war and stuck into this uh, hotchpotch of a vehicle, uh, you might think, I don't want to have to expose myself on the roof of this thing. I want to stay hidden. That's what that's what we're deployed. We're in the hedge, right? We want to stay hidden. I don't want to be seen. Uh, I'll just go, I'll just work these, these controls from inside. Oh, it makes a really loud noise, doesn't it? Brilliant. Let's hope it just scares the enemy away. Um, I can understand why people didn't want to get up out there and, and, and fire it actually looking down the sights. Um, but just because something's popular doesn't mean it's effective. There's no gunner's sight either side of the mantlet. No piercings anyway. Essentially, that's it. That's what you've got to see the world through. Good luck. The proper name for the gun was the PAC-39 L48-75. Right, I suppose I should uh, explain what all that means. Well, PAC is uh, an abbreviation for uh, Panzer Abwehr Kanone. Um, Panzer, it means armor, but it's often used to mean tank. Um, Abwehr is sort of defense, as in Ministry of Defense, Army sort of thing, and Kanone is, well, cannon. Uh, so it's an armor or, or a tank defense cannon. It's an anti-tank gun. Um, and uh, 39 was the year in which it was um, uh, approved, uh, designed, whatever. Um, L48, right. L48 refers to the 75. 75 is the millimeter caliber uh, of the barrel. So the, 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 the bore going down the barrel is 75 millimeters in diameter. So that's also the diameter of the shell that comes out of the barrel. And L48 is the number of times that 75 uh, uh, divides into the length of the barrel. So if you multiply 75 millimeters by uh, L48, you get uh, 3,600 millimeters, which was the length of the barrel. Um, generally speaking, they try to make barrels as light and as short as they can get away with. Uh, but if you want a high velocity gun, you want an awful lot of the energy in the propellant uh, pushing the shell up the barrel uh, to transfer its energy to that barrel, uh, in, to that shell. Uh, so if you have a very short barrel, then a lot of the energy just goes flying out the front of that barrel before it's actually done its work accelerating the shell. So you need a longer barrel, um, but you don't want it too long because then uh, the energy is expended and then you've just got an unnecessarily long barrel and a little bit of friction and, and so forth, even slowing the thing down. So they did their calculations and they worked out that the shortest barrel that they could get uh, full value of the, of the propellant out of was an L48. How would you like to be in this thing? There's nothing on the right hand side. That's an engine cover there. There's nothing on the left hand side. There's no hatch or anything like that at the front. What you've got is this hatch here. That's it. Seriously, one hatch in the roof for both gunners and the driver, and the rooftop MG gets in the way of that a bit. The commander has a tiny two-part hatch with a periscope in the way of the front part. This thing's a death trap. No commander's cupola. Inside the thing, the commander can see the backsides of the men in front of him. And if he's lucky, possibly something through his periscope. That is the sight which moves left and right in that arc along with the, uh, the gun. Obviously it's missing with the optics there. Now it seems that this design was actually inspired by a Romanian design. Uh, only prototypes of this were made and it was called the Marshal. Now, uh, granted that man is wearing a terribly large hat, but don't be too fooled by the scale of that. You can see the size of the overall man and the one next to him. And so you can see that that vehicle is tiny. But the Germans looked at that and thought, you know, they've got something though. It's, it's, it's low, it's going to be fairly easy to armor quite well at the front, and you can put a reasonably big gun in it, and uh, maybe there's a way we can make this cheaply. Ah, I know, why don't we get old 38Ts and convert? Or use the same factory setups to make new things, but with a lot of the same tools. Yeah, that could work. And so they did. Now, they started developing it in 1943 in Prague, which is, of course, the capital of Czechoslovakia, uh, at the, here we go, Burmish Mährische Maschinenfabrik, or BMM plant, as most uh, tank enthusiasts refer to it. Uh, and it wasn't until about April 44 that they really started putting these into mass production. And they made something like two and a half thousand, uh, a few more perhaps, but not many more than two and a half thousand of them. 
And uh, actually, uh, while well, I say um, they uh, after the war, the, the Czechs carried on producing them, and they called it the the S uh, ST1, and then they sold it to the Swiss, who renamed it the G13. So there you go. This vehicle has no shortage of names. The vehicle the Hetzer replaced was the open-topped Marda series, like this. Uh, these also put a 75mm gun on the chassis of a Czech Type 38, uh, but the Mardas had thinner armour, a higher profile and, of course, an open top, so some considered the Hetzer to be safer. But I think that one thing that keeps a crew safe is an ability to see. Also, being on the side that's winning is quite handy, and by the time anyone got into a uh, Hetzer on the battlefield, the Germans weren't winning. Though it was decently armoured at the front, the sides were typically only 20 millimetres thick and the top was only 8 millimetres thick. So yeah, getting on for bulletproof, but if anything substantial hit it there, that uh, vehicle was in big trouble. And the front suspension, of course, had to bear the weight of all this extra armour at the front and the big gun, uh, which stuck out the front as well. And early versions apparently drooped quite markedly at the front. They did redesign the suspension and they kept uh, upgrading it, but even the later versions were struggling under this new weight. The heads are weighed 50 15.8 metric tons, which was nearly uh, in combat, that is, which was nearly double the weight of the 38T on pond which it was based. Uh, so it was always going to be struggling in that department. Note these scissors periscope sticking out of the commander's hatch near the back. There was a plan to add a 360 degree rotating periscope to give him at least some all round vision, but they never acted on this. Now the Hetzer was not fast. If you look at a lot of sources, they'll say that it clipped along at a fairly sprightly 26 miles per hour. That doesn't seem all that slow for you metric fans. That's about 41 kilo metres per imperial hour. Sorry to mix uh, imperial and, uh, and metric. Um, and that, that seems to be a reasonable lick, though there were of course plenty of tanks that were faster. But that's, that's under ideal conditions on a good road. Cross country, it was not that great shakes, and it was not considered uh, to be fast enough to keep up with motorised infantry. So really, it was reduced to a, uh, a lurk in bushes, a shoot and scoot role. Uh, but in that uh, particular role, it was perfectly adequate. It had a gun that could knock out most of the things that the Allies had at the time, and um, it was reasonably small, so easy to hide, but uh, I wouldn't have liked to be in this thing when you had to do the scoot bit, uh, turning around really slowly and awkwardly and blindly, and then exposing your thin rear armour to the enemy as you trundled slowly away. Um, but anyway, it uh, was uh, credited with a fair few uh, kills, if you like, although you could say that um, in terms of war effort that was a little bit pointless because this, this was sort of spiteful sniping at the enemy that was by this stage in the late war rolling forwards and inevitably going to win. So uh, yes, they, they, they achieved a few spiteful uh, bits of attrition against the, the rolling forward front of the massively overwhelming enemy, both on the east and on the western front. About 50 Hetzers were made into flamethrower vehicles or flam panzers, which saw use on the western front. This is a model, clearly. I couldn't find a copyright-free image of the real thing. Now, I would not want to have to fight in one of these. We've got very little in the way of escape hatches. One or maybe two crew members can see forwards, but you're otherwise blind, and you are inside with the flamethrower fuel, with thin side armour, and you have to get very close to the enemy. Not flipping likely. Somebody sent me this. It's, it's uh, I'd have to say, it's a lovely colour, so thank you very much. And uh, it, it's quite a good fit as well, so it'll come in really handy for when I do those desert warfare things. Uh, anyway, uh, it's time that I tell you about the sponsor, which is Audible. Now, what is Audible? <laughs> as though you didn't know. Uh, Audible, until recently, described itself as the greatest collection of audiobooks available in the world. But now they've gone one further. Now it's the greatest collection of audiobooks available on the planet. Yes, and that's got to be greater on the planet. Whew. Wow. So they certainly do have an awful lot of audiobooks. Uh, so if there's uh, some topic that interests you, they'd like you to have a book in it. The, the excuse, oh, there won't be anything there that interests me, is pretty unlikely to wash, frankly. Uh, just go there and have a look. And if you text Lindy Beige to 500-500 or visit www audible.com stroke Lindy Beige, then you will find details of an offer. Yes, it's a, a free 30-day period uh, during which uh, you can have the run of the site and buy stuff at a discount and you get one free audiobook that's yours to keep forever, even if you never uh, decide ever to have anything else to do with Audible again. It's still yours forever and two what they call Audible Originals. And these are things that are only available through Audible and they're all sorts of things. They're works of literature and they're 
journalism and and self-help books and oh, all sorts of stuff so there you are going for your runs you you, you fitness fanatics you on that long boring train journey or your regular commute to work perhaps and you've got something to be playing into your ears the whole time um, so why not text Lindy Beige to 500 500 or go to I'm gonna have to say it again uh, www.audible.com stroke Lindy Beige and uh, then you can find all those offers of which I I spoke and and one of the things that you might care to look at because you're watching this video so you're obviously interested in tanks and possibly um, interested in the the Russian front because I noticed that one of the books there uh, was a war memoir called Tank Rider uh, by Besanov um, Ev Evgeny Besanov I think his name was this is a work uh, of which I was aware many years ago when I first encountered it and I tell you it's a hair-raising tale um, how much of it is true I don't know I've only got him uh, you know a a as a source uh, but um, there were I'm sure plenty of people around who survived the same events that he lived through and so would have been in a, in a position to contradict him had he just made a load of stuff up it's uh, he he's fighting as a tank rider as the uh, title suggests and uh, so th the Russians didn't have enough lorries to move all their soldiers in World War II so infantry often rode on the back of tanks not into battle generally just towards the battle once you're uh, going into battle you really don't want to be on the back of a tank the tank is a, a, a large noisy thing so everyone can see it and everyone can hear it and it attracts fire uh, from all quarters so you really don't want to be on the back of that you want to get off it as, as quickly as possible once the enemy uh, makes his presence known and you want to be within jumping range of a ditch to keep yourself safe anyway so he was a, an infantryman uh, a tank rider and yes he lived through some pretty hair-raising battles and it, he wasn't just in danger from the Germans you understand people on his own side kept putting him in harm's way I don't know that any of them tried to kill him directly but they seemed uh, very keen to uh, to give him near suicidally dangerous missions to carry out against the enemy in the hope that the Germans would do the job for him uh, yikes yes anyway so uh, you, there you go um, uh, you could click the link in the, in the description it's, it's an easier way to get to the site now uh, all right back to the action the Polish rebels of the Warsaw Uprising captured one of these and they called it Chwat or Chwat um, saying it in the proper P Polish way which means a, a bold and resourceful person apparently it's quite an archaic term anyway it defended a barricade near the post office and outside the army museum in Warsaw you can see a Hetzer today although not one in the mintiest of condition. This particular Hetzer was scuttled by its crew, who were probably the Wehrmacht 73rd Infantry Division, on January the 17th, 1945, near a place called Blonny. Um, possibly it broke down or ran out of fuel first, so they chose not to hand it to the enemy in a usable, one careful owner format. This view here shows you how incredibly cramped it was in there. Four men squeezed into that forward fighting compartment, filled almost entirely with gun and somehow 41 rounds of armour-piercing ammunition. Whatever they used to blow it up did a thorough job. The engine decks are missing entirely and the thin armour of the back half is just blown apart, shattered in places and bent in others. No, that disc at the back is not an escape hatch. That's the main air intake for the engine so you're not getting out that way. Looks as though they could attach a muzzle brake or something to the barrel, but I've never seen an example of a German World War II Hetzer in war service with a muzzle brake. So there you have it, the Hetzer. And a lot of people looking at this think, well, it's got a cool name and it looks pretty cool. Uh, and, uh, you know, it did do its job. So well done to, to the Hetzer. And people like making little models of it and painting it up and sticking it on the wargaming table and, and rolling dice and so forth. But... I am very, very, and frankly, I think you should be very, very too, glad that neither of us ever had to fight in this thing because you're in a thinly armoured, apart from the front, little cramped box packed with ammunition. And uh, if you're in that vehicle at all, then you're at a stage in the war when you're losing. So, yeah, if you get in the time machine, go backwards. Don't get into a Hetzer. That's a really really bad idea oh but the one thing that was really good about the Hetzer was they were really cheap and crews just love that <laughs>